coming. I really appreciate you coming. And I always love meeting the entrepreneurs and seeing what wild things they're all working on. It always blows my mind. And I'm just so happy that this is here. Um, and I, I know Ken Myers, and he will give you a great lecture. If you do have an opportunity to see him, I would definitely recommend going to see him. Um, if I stand here, will everyone be able to see? OK. All right. Um, we don't have to talk about that except to say that I, I love working with UW because the, the people that are coming through this system are just extraordinary. And I, I really um, think you have a great opportunity to learn from each other, to get your dreams into reality, and it, you know, take full advantage of it here. Um, today we're going to talk about value propositions. And I was going to spend about a half an hour kind of talking through that, um, but leave another half an hour for Q&A. And if anyone has any questions that are not addressed during the q and I'm happy to stay late and have a one-on-one -on -one with anyone that has anything particular you want to get into. Um, there are quizzes throughout this that you can either take seriously and write down your answers, or you can just think through. So if you do have pieces of paper and are the kind of person who, who writes notes, um, you could do that. Um, so let's get going. Um, Value proposition, dog. Everyone knows kind of what a dog is. So, you know, if you're thinking about the point of view of, you know, how did that dog get into the house? There's usually a number of conversations, and maybe it went like this. A dog would teach our child responsibility. That would be the rational way a dog gets into a house. But the way often dogs get into the houses are more complicated. They're more stakeholders. Some of them have fears. Some of them have dreams. Other ones, you know, are calculating the cost and benefits. So you've got emotion, you've got rationality, and you've got multiple stakeholders. And that's really how value propositions live. They live in a messy, muddy world. Um, and so there are many ways that we talk about value propositions. Companies will talk about them from a number of points of view. And I, I brought up two that I think are really good. Um, the first one is the American Market Marketing Association's version, which is a value proposition is what is promised by a company's marketing and sales efforts and then fulfilled by its delivery and its customer service processes. Um, there's also a UW Lean Canvas one. How many of you guys are using Lean Canvas, by the way? Do you know about that yet? Some of you, okay. Um, single, clear, compelling message that says, why are you different and worth buying? Um, so before I go any further, I just wanted to get a sense of who's in the room and how far along you are in your efforts. Um, how many of you guys are at the idea phase? Just raise your hand. Okay, some gleam in the eyes. How many of you are kind of up through prototyping? Got You got one. You got one. Um, how many of you are kind of in the market or about to be in the market? Okay, so you're all stages. Um, who's in consumer products? Okay, and then the rest of you B2B? No? Um, what about some of your industries that you're doing? I know you've got a hair accessory. Um, call out what you're doing again. <laughs> VR. Radiology. Yeah, VR. Um, ben. Software. Yeah. What else are you guys working on? FMB. What is FMB? Uh, food and beverage. Oh, food and beverage. Got it. Okay. Sorry, I thought you said FMB. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. Anybody working in the medical space? Okay. Any in software? Um, design. Got a, a big range here. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak to as much of a range as I can. Um, so let's talk about um, what the value proposition is from the consumer's point of view is what I get versus what I pay. What's in it for me? So this is how um, I was trained to think about value propositions in the consumer world, and that's where a lot of the deepest work has, has been done on value prop. Um, this is the one question you always have to ask yourself. <laughs> Um, why would you want one, which is the other question you should be asking. The first thing is about everyone in your company understands the promise that you have to deliver on and can talk about it in a consistent way. So it's not just about marketing or sales. It's also about what features you build into your product. So it affects everything. So it's a, it's a way to help you focus. Um, the second reason is that people can easily decide whether to choose you. you know, so who's going to buy? Who's going to invest? Who's going to come and work for you? You know, so it has some really profound effects, so it's really important that you have your point of view pretty clearly articulated. Um, so for those of you using Lean Canvas, where value proposition fits is in the first two stages where you're identifying your target customers and figuring out 
what is that single clear compelling message that says why are you different and worth buying? So if you're already using Lean Canvas, this is where it all fits together, making sense? Okay. Um, this is a framework that I've cobbled together based on the shoulders of many giants. It builds off of work from Procter & Gamble, from Jeffrey Moore, um, and it also includes some of the work that, <laughs> you know them, <laughs> work, you know, work that I've done over the years with my own um, companies and clients. Um, so there are different frameworks, and if this one doesn't work for you, you can look them up and find others. But um, they usually have a target audience who has a problem. They usually have a category that you're competing in or against if you're disrupting something. Um, you're talking about delivering on a benefit and how it either solves a problem for customers or delights them in a way that was totally unexpected and, and now they can't live without. Um, that has reasons why, which are your differentiating proof points. So this is like, why would I believe that you're going to get this benefit? So that's sort of the, the top half of the value proposition. And the bottom half is all about what you pay, which is the part that people don't usually include in the value statements. But that's how consumers think about it. They're, they're going benefit, cost. So that's what is required is what does the customer pay in price, time investment, risk, all that. Um, so that's a framework that um, I've found pretty useful over the years, and it, it can apply to most cases, I'd say. Uh, so now I want to take you through a couple of examples so you can see it in action. Uh, the first one is Uber, and this is from a couple of years ago, but it's illustrative. Um, this is the business to consumer value proposition. So if you look at that, the target is for people who just need a ride. I don't need a car. I just want to get from here to there today right now. Um, Uber is an on-demand cab service. Um, that offers the easiest way to get around at the tap of a button because you can get a taxi or a car or a ride share from your mobile phone. That's part of what makes it easy. Uber connects you with the driver in minutes. Um, your credit card's automatically charged, so it's falling off a log and it proof. You can do it when you're, you know, at New Year's Eve and have hang celebrated. <laughs> um, all that's required is you have to install the app, create your account in minutes, and price reflects the demand. It's up to you to agree. Um, so if you're the contractor, the driver, the value proposition might be for people who want to be your own bosses. You know, I'm not working for the man. I am the man. Um, Uber's an on-demand cab service, so it's the same thing uh, that lets you earn money as an independent contractor uh, because you get paid in fares for driving on your own schedule. So isn't that just wonderful? It's all about my schedule. Um, all that's required is you got to be 21 or more. You got to have a four-door car, 2005 or newer meet all your insurance, licensing, and registration requirements, and pass a background and driving record check. Now, that's kind of a long list of costs, right? Um, plus the gas and maintenance. So one of the things Uber was doing early on was offering incentives for joining. That helped them get over this idea that this is a heavy cost, right? Um, so if you're not sure whether you're B to C or B to B, it's helpful to write it from both points of view and see who might fill it, find it the most compelling. That, that's a good um, exercise to try. Um, but then there's the important part of value propositions, which is not stated, which is just felt. Um, pictures are worth a thousand words. And, and if you look at this one, doesn't that show like I am the man, I'm the power person in this relationship, how proud I am. I've got this beautiful white steed. Um, So let's talk about the different components of a value proposition, starting with the target. Um, your choice of target's really critical, and it's not always obvious what it should be or who it should be. Um, the Medify company was a UW spin-out that I consulted to. Um, it was founded by a guy named Derek Street, whose daughter had a rare medical condition that he was trying to research. The research existed, but it was all over the internet in different places. And so he started a company that gathered all that information and let people search and filter it based <coughs> on their situation. So it could be, you know, what kind of condition you have, are you suffering from breast cancer or leukemia, or it could be where you live, or, you know, various kinds of filters so that you could easily sift through all that stuff and find the relevant information that you needed to save your child's life. Clearly, a parent or a caregiver cares about that. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what conditions we should be building for. So is it breast cancer? Is it autism? Is it, is it leukemia? Is it kidney disease? So that we could narrow our target further. And we, we went through a lot of effort to figure out 
where the really good targets were. And we settled on top two. And then he got into the market and discovered that physicians had an enormous need for this. After all, they know how to use all those databases, but for them, time is money and time is saving lives. And for them, they could just plow right through it. So we were amazed to discover there was an even better target out there. Um, so it's really valuable to keep your eyes peeled for the possibility that there might be somebody even better out there. Um, so on the one hand, your venture capital people are going to say, focus, focus, focus. And on the other hand, you can't have a blinder on and not, not be ready for it. Um, and the way you get through that is you keep asking your customers all the time. Um, make sense? Okay. Um, so if you are writing something down, you want to take a quick exercise right now. Think about, for your company, what problem or unmet need are you addressing? Um, and who is your target audience and who really has a stake in it? You just want to give that a minute of thought. Um, and by the way, I think you can get this online, so um, don't worry about capturing all the screenshots. Um, we'll make it available one way or the other. Um, okay. <coughs> so let's talk about another B2B value proposition. This is for Yapta, which is a local Seattle startup in the travel field. Um, for corporate travel program managers who hate to overpay, notice there's an emotional component here. Um, YAPTA is the travel price assurance expert. You might argue that you know some people will know what that means and some people may not, uh, but they're about figuring out you didn't pay too much. That allows you to book airfare and hotels with the confidence, another emotional word, you'll get the lowest available price. The reason you can believe that is because YAPTA automatically gets you the refund refunds when the prices go down after booking without disrupting your traveler's plans in any way, which could be really upsetting, um, typically saving 1% to 2% of your travel budget. So that's like tangible results that they can prove. Very handy. All that's required is to pay based on the performance or by a transaction, and you're up and running in two to three weeks and no software upgrades required. It's all in the cloud, so you know it's easy peasy. Um, so very, you know, very well measured value prop. <coughs> Um, and to see it in, ac <laughs> in action, this is a screen grab from their website, and you see someone is flying on a lower cost ticket. That's getting at that feeling like, I don't want to be the travel manager whose top salesperson walked into my office and said, I was online for five minutes and I found a better deal. What's the matter with you? you know, that's usually motivating. <laughs> uh, the other thing they're very clear about is what you're saving per trip. And I think they've been experimenting with whether you should save per trip or total savings, you know, and I'm sure they'll have refined this over the time that they've been in business. Um, but the point is, is that it's very tangible and provable. Um, so let me talk about a second aspect of value propositions that I touched on with the dog example. Decision making is rational and emotional. And the more we're learning about the neuroscience of how people make decisions, there's that frontal lobe that's making the rational thing, but something like 95% of your actions and your decisions are actually based on your lizard brain. So speak to that lizard brain. <laughs> Acknowledge this guy, but really know that the, the good work has to be done in the, the rest of your brain. Um, this is very exciting to learn because in the consumer products world, we always believed that, but now we've got scientific evidence that makes the B2B community feel a little better about moving this direction. So let's talk about reasons why. The best proofs are demonstrations, because that's experiential and you can see it and all of your senses are involved in, in seeing. So for your um, hair blow dryer accessory, you know, it, the stylus thing is a perfect example of showing how fabulous you know, your prototype is. So you can't. Um, testimonials. Um, People like to buy from people that they feel are just like them, with the only exception being that they know about this new thing. You know, so you find your tribe, it's, it's something very deep, and if you find that somebody in your peer group has tried and used this product and loves it, then you're going to be very comfortable trying it compared to hearing it from the company or from a random stranger. So if you can find a way to get testimonials going, that's a wonderful way to do this. Um, and then for supporting facts to be specific, all that evidence that Yapta showed, you know, the dollar savings and being able to back that up with how do we get to those numbers, that's also very powerful. So those are, those are three, and you can use <coughs> many of them at the same time. You don't have to pick one. So far, so good? Okay. Right. 
So another quick exercise is to think about what category are you competing in? You know, what do you call yourselves? Um, and I'll give you an example from the publishing world. Um, I um, am also an author, and there was a local startup called Booktrope that was basically deconstructing the whole publishing industry. They got rid of printing books and physically sending them to stores. They did everything print on demand. Um, everything was online. Um, they used everything that you know you would want in a publishing house if you'd started today and never had heard of what publishers used to do. You know, it's an ancient industry. Uh, they were trying to figure out, are they an online publishing house? Are they hybrid? Are they team? You know, because each one had different meanings, and, and they, they agonized over it for the longest time trying to figure it out. Because team publishing is like how the movie makers do it, you know, where everyone takes a cut. Um, if you're hybrid, that sounds like, well, you're not really sure what you are. Um, so anyway, the choice of how you talk about the category you're in is really important. Um, so let's, you know, also think about what rational and emotional benefits can your target get from using your product. So make sure you've got, you know, a list of both those possibilities. Um, and what makes you uniquely able to deliver? You know, hi ideally you're the only one or the first <laughs> or the best. Um, so let's talk about what you pay. This is, you know, people think they're buying the dog and what they might end up being afraid of is that they got the dog that peed on the computer. Um, the way to think about it, this is, this is based on a framework that a, a old colleague of mine who is a presentation skills expert, um, it's called Remember Your Mom, um, <laughs> motivation minus objection equals movement. So in this case, it's benefit minus cost equals movement. And there's a lot of discussion in the startup world that you need kind of like 10 times the benefit for one time the cost to get people over the hump, because you know, we're basically you know, comfortable with doing nothing <laughs> if we can. You know, so you know, think about how much you need to overcome objections. Um, what are the motivations and objections you might run into? You know, this is not a complete list, but there's the functional benefits. You know, I'm getting a financial benefit. I'm getting time, you know, savings benefit. I might be saving a life or extending a quality of life. I might be giving someone a better customer experience overall, and that's worth something. Um, there could be emotional benefits like safety and security. There could be reputation and status, like the app to travel manager was going to get a good bump in status if she was always smarter than that sales guy or gal. Um, Self-expression is an emotional benefit. There's a lot of different you know, things that you can tap into. Um, objections, what I pay can be hard costs, like costs of you know, financial costs, or it could be perceived actual time and effort. Um, not only to consider it, but to buy it, to use it, and maintain it. You know, so that dog is like, who's taking that dog for a walk? Um, soft obstacles could be, I'm afraid of buying from a startup. You could be gone in 30 days. That's a big one. Um, fear of making the wrong choice. You know, there, there used to be an adage saying you never, you know, got in trouble buying from IBM, even though IBM was often a very expensive solution. Um, you're not going to get fired. Um, it might not be a top priority for your customers, and if it's not, then maybe they're the wrong target. Um, concerned about how others will react is another one. You know, there's a bunch of them, but think about it, you know, both from the hard costs and the soft obstacles and the functional and emotional benefits. Um, if you can tap into really basic human needs, the, the further down you go in Maslow's hierarchy of benefits, the more likely it is you're going to have something super compelling. Do you guys know who Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Okay, yeah, I, I'm seeing a lot of nods. If you can get down to that red zone, bingo, you know. Um, but wherever you are, you know, just, just think about where you can tap into basic human needs. Um, and I'll give you an example from Doritos, of all things. <laughs> Doritos is a snack food. It is a gut stuffer. It's a wonderful, wonderful product. Um, <laughs> one of the things we discovered was that teens were heavy, salty snackers. And guess what? You know, teens like to break the rules. So if Doritos is part of breaking the rules because of its bold taste, um, if you can kind of demonstrate that connection, it, it's more appealing. And believe it or not, we were able to do that. Um, so another quick exercise. Um, what would your target audience pay in terms of time, money, any kind of risk, <coughs> um, emotional costs? And can any of those be minimized and reframed as a benefit? So back to the Uber thing, you know, they were going through a lot of hoops to qualify. 
Um, you know, does that mean that they're with a great group of drivers and that every single driver has got a fantastic car and you can trust anybody in Uber? Um, maybe that high standard is helpful for those people to connect with each other. Um, what can you address directly in the value proposition statement and which can you show and not tell? If you can show them and not tell them, it's much more powerful. So just consider that. Um, Let's talk about value propositions over time. Has anyone here tried to quit smoking? <laughs> you guys are only one person. I'm so proud of you. You never started. Um, in my generation, a whole bunch of us were smoking as teenagers. Um, and, you know, I was smoking at the age of 13, which is horrible. Never do this. Um, I decided I had to quit. Um, and so I knew I was addicted and I enjoyed smoking. I got a lot of value out of smoking but I felt horrible and I knew I was gonna die sooner. Um, so I knew it made sense to quit. So then I quit. I'm saving some money, I can start to taste my food, but on the other hand, I'm withdrawing from nicotine, I'm gaining weight, and this is not fun. That's, you know, once you're in, it's a lot harder. That value proposition is a lot tougher to maintain. But once I'm through and we've finished quitting and I'm off, lungs clear up, the family is happy, um, bingo, wonderful value proposition. So when you're thinking about writing one, you're writing it for the point of view of after all the benefits have been received. But when you're actually delivering it, think about what stages your potential target audience is going through and make sure your value proposition is on the positive side every step of the way. Um, this is something that most people don't talk about, but it's hugely important. Um, it has to be compelling at every stage. So the stages might include consideration, purchase, repeat. It might be um, trial and use, you know, whatever is normal for the way people are buying whatever it is that you're, you're selling. Think about it at every stage. Um, so I won't go through all of these, but you, you get the general idea here. Um, so if you were to think about consideration, purchase, repeat, um, what are the benefits and reasons why that are most motivating at every stage? What are the costs that are most difficult to overcome at every stage? and which of these should be addressed in the value proposition statement up front. Like people know nicotine withdrawal is terrible. So maybe part of your value proposition is will help you through those terrible months or however long it takes you. Um, so when we start really phrasing a value proposition, the one thing that's really important is that specificity is king. So on the left are all the blah, 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 flabby, flabby, bad, bad. On the right is tight, crisp, and compelling stuff. So if you can say your number one is rated by somebody important, that's better than saying I'm the best, I'm wonderful, awesome. If we're innovative, that's wallpaper. If you're the only one, that's meaningful. Um, if you're fast, that's lovely, but if you can say you're faster than the speeding bullet because I'm Superman, I'm <laughs> that's faster. Um, more powerful than locomotive, you know where I'm headed with this. Um, Cost savings take, you know, easy to use should be takes five minutes. Cost savings is saves 10%. Awesome is, uh, if it's awesome, just show it. Do not tell me it's awesome, please. It just says you were not very think thinking very clearly about your value prop. Um, and by the way, this is not easy stuff. Give yourself a break. You will go through many versions of this. Um, but to summarize, the, the choice of target is critical. Decision making is both rational and emotional, so tap into that, take advantage of all that in neuroscience. Remember your mom, motivation minus objection equals movement. Um, the proposition needs to be compelling at every stage that people are going through your, your trial and use. Um, write your statements in plain English and be specific. Um, and now I just have to caveat. If you're talking to a highly technical audience and you know <coughs> how to speak to that technical audience and you want to use their language, go for it. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a nuance. Um, so they're tough to write, they're tougher to deliver on. Um, it's important to validate and refine them all the time. You know, don't get sucked into it, but just remember that the more you learn, the more you're gonna be able to refine what you're doing and expect the evolution. Medify was on a great path, but then they found this extraordinary path. Um, so um, if you do it right, you get that <laughs> as the <laughs> dog. <laughs> So now it's your turn to ask questions. Um, I think we're right on the half hour. That's great. Yeah. So I have a few questions. One is, what do you think about the explanation of you can build your tongue versus you can get after it again? So if you use powder, you can use it again. And then the other one is use versus building something, thinking that it's like a little toy you can build in the future. 
Mm -hmm. <coughs> I've seen it work both ways. The important thing is that you meet in the middle. You know, there's no one answer to that. Um, if you are doing something that is not a problem solver, then building it and they come is, is likely to be um, a good avenue. You know, like Steve Jobs did not, you know, go out and say to the world, what would you like in a new phone? He had a vision of a new phone and people saw it and they went, huh, okay. So that was a demonstration. Um, and that's because no one could have imagined that. But if you're curing cancer and, <laughs> you know, and you know who has cancer, <laughs> You want to test on those people. You want to be talking to them about whatever your program is. You know, so, so sometimes if it's a problem, it's easier to get you know, real feedback. Um, but people have done it right from either direction as long as you've got the connection. I think it's too often if you cannot get a decision made. You know, at some point, you've got to move on. Um, I will tell you that in the venture community, there's a guy named Steve Blank who's convinced you need to talk to at least 40 people before you even have a pattern. Um, it's been my experience, you talk to people as long as you're hearing something new, and then you stop when you start hearing the same thing over and over again. Um, so I think frequent dips is good, but don't be paralyzed by it. And there's no one answer for that, honestly. If your venture capitalist is telling you to talk to 40 people, make sure you talk to 40 people, though, because <laughs> then they know that you would listen to them. <laughs> Who else has a question? Yeah? So, working on your main pain list mm -hmm. for the individual product versus, you know, your company slash organization. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, th I think I understand because, like, for example, let me use PepsiCo because people know what that is. They've got Doritos, they've got Fritos, they've got whoever, they've got 7-Up, Pepsi, whatever. Um, each of those brands has its own value proposition statement, but the company overall knows I at the time it was in the snacking business and it was in the what they called um, full beverage business. You know, so the corporation had a clear point of view on, on what categories they were in. But then when you got down to Fritos, you had to decide if you're a corn chip. Well, we got 80% of the market. So you say you're a corn chip. That's not really a helpful choice. But if you say you're competing with um, meal substitutes like hot dogs, then suddenly you know, you've broadened your audience. So there's, there's usually one of each. Now, in a startup, they're almost usually the same. So I would, I would start with your product <coughs> first. Okay. Yeah. Who else has a question? Yeah. Well, are you asking about the product itself fulfilling on the promise, or are you thinking about how you would talk about it? How you talk about okay. it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you want to be, A, first of all, focusing on the benefits and features that they find motivating. That's number one, is to know what, what are the important benefits and features. Number two, it's finding the same kind of language that they would trust. Um, and number three, it's finding a spokesperson that is, is someone that they find credible. You know, those are top three right off the bat. Okay. Um, there are others, but that, that's, it matters really to think about what they need to hear from you and how they need to hear it and from whom and where and when. Yeah. yeah. It's also difficult having <coughs> you have multiple value propositions, customer centric or organizational centric, mm -hmm. and you're trying to find the right fit. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Like investors that get the same thing. Yeah. Yep, yep, I understand. Um, what you're doing is the same. The benefits are going to be different. The reasons why may be different. Um, if you're talking to investors, they want to know they're going to get their money out, that they're not going to lose it, that you're going to be a good steward, that you're going to listen to them. So part of your value proposition is making sure you're taking their feedback <laughs> in and not just talking at them. You know, that's, that's part of your value proposition is that they can trust to invest in you. Um, when you're talking to the technical audience, they're probably more concerned about can you deliver it, you know, and how, um, how effective it is. Um, so it's in the eyes of the beholder, 
but you're working to the same end point. Um, Yeah, and I, what I do is I start with who benefits. You know, so if it's a medical device or something to do with cancer curing, you're talking about the patient, but then there may be considerations for that doctor or whoever's helping them, you know, that, but it all has to have integrity. It, and so I, I start from that user. Does that make sense? Um, yes? Yes. Yeah. So what kind of dynamic starting point for the communication for technology providers mm. that you know that you know you don't always get the best kind of results from either end? Yeah. Oh boy, that's a tough one. Um <laughs> I would say um if you know who your investor is and what evidence they need to be willing to take you to that next step. Th it's really something that the pitch people will be able to help you with. But it's starting from where are they, what do they need in order to invest? Um, and do you have it in a, cr a credible way? You know, if you're talking to an angel, it might be the idea would be enough. If you're talking to a late stage investor, they're gonna wanna see a lot more. So it's, it's in there, it's in the eye of their beholder. And I think if you were to go to the pitch session, you'd find people who could address that in a deeper way than I think I could do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? I'm not sure whether my question is relevant. <coughs> I think um, a lot of times when we, when we develop things like this, we're looking to mm -hmm. solve an issue. And the problem with that is that we still, when we pitch it, we have this problem that we think that people accept it. Mm -hmm. And then when, for example, my, my case, I'm a resident, so I think that I'm the best in my population but when it comes to the point for cost reduction, maybe I'm not. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to understand that little gap okay. that comes in between between what we think is a good value proposition and how to make people want to take that action and come and buy the product and give them a choice. Well, it starts with, did they need it? You know, are you talking to the right people? Mm -hmm. Did they really need it? Restaurants, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I would be feeding people and say, how is this? Mm -hmm. You know? And if people are saying, that's nice, you're not going to get them back. Mm -hmm. If they say, oh my God, there's nothing like this in town, it, like it's my family's recipe in my mind, I'm coming back every week, I'm bringing my friends, then you've got you know, at least one person, right? Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, that's, that's a really important question that you're raising, because it's not about what we're saying and writing down, it's what are we doing for people at the end of the day. Yeah. This, is no <laughs> <laughs> this is life, <laughs> you know? Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Anybody in the back? Yes? Mm-hmm. 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 Right. Mm. Right. It's not. Um, I think it's, if you think about the reasons why, are you the best, the only, and is that a really compelling thing that you're doing? You know, uh, Jeffrey Moore in particular, his work on value proposition, he nails that question. You know, and he has a lot of good advice on how to pitch um, to the way the investors are going to be respectful of. Um, and if you're one of many, they might, you know, give you a little bit. But if you're technology, uh, what is your business? Let me just first ask that. Um, oh, my God. Okay. All right, I'll ask the question. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing this now. I just got it. I'm petting it. Um, all right. So in your case, let's see. Um, Pet this cashmere compared to all this other cashmere that's in the market. This feels soft and slinky, and the other ones are nubby and they're pilling, and it's not any fun. 
you know, if you can demonstrate that, or you can demonstrate that it's from a particular cashmere goat from an area that no one has ever seen before, and these goats have never experienced pollution, and therefore their cashmere is incredibly eco-friendly. I'm making all this up clearly, you know. <laughs> but if that is a relevant point of view to your um, audience, you know, it's about finding that edge. Well, it's also about finding the right audience. That's right. That's right. Yeah, are you talking to the Neiman Marcus crowd, or are you talking to the Land's End crowd? Um, so it starts with understanding who that target is. You can start from the target end and say, all right, we've got something that is unique and people are going to value. You know, it might be cashmere um, fashioned into fashions by an important group of people that, you know, needs the money. You know, could be that. <laughs> cashmere lingerie? Oh, my God. All right. For those who live in the Ural Mountains, <laughs> for whom this is not a terrible imposition, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I worked in both lingerie and um, I'm a cashmere junkie, so I, I hope you're successful is all I can say. Um, who else? Sure. So the comment is with Uber. Mm -hmm. um, they actually started with a silly gift and prize box. Yeah, yeah, and I'm and sure they they were targeting to supplement yeah. um, people who yeah. were going around at the place and not mm -hmm. and so they were uh, ahead. Yeah. So stay tuned. Yeah. Um, so with that, since you are talking to a lot of entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. around Seattle, and I guess I'll be speaking in your question, is how many do you see a value proposition of people just wanting to <laughs> I think that's a key, uh, key flaw. Um, I think it's really easy to fall in love with your own product and your own vision and then be unwilling to accept any other possibility. And I think your own group think in your <coughs> head, you, you could you'd be your own worst enemy. Um, so I think the ways around it are to be constantly pinging, you know, your possible targets and, and getting real feedback. And that means asking open-ended questions and not saying, how about it? You know, <laughs> like, you know, making them give you a polite answer. Um, it means having a board that is willing to tell you truly and listening to them. It's having outside advisors that'll tell you stuff. Um, but I think a lot, of it, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs shoot themselves. I really do. And you don't need to do that. <laughs> That's not a gloom and doom. That's normal. <laughs> well, everybody, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep on treading the water. <laughs> keep on going, believe. I, I, I guess that's my point, too, is like, you know, if, if you're open and flexible, but you keep going, something is likely to come through. So that to me <coughs> you know. is my question for all of this, mm -hmm. is a matter of accepting the information that comes in and the skills and expectations as they are now fit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, both yeah. Intellectual communication, mm -hmm. product experience, mm -hmm. whatever it may be for the people that you talk to, and it'll fit you too. So I just want to say both what are you doing with and exactly what you're doing with. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh gosh. All right, let me think about it from the point of view of the best first, because that'll I have to figure out who I can talk about without you recognizing you, them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, you're Peter with you on that. Um, yeah. Um well the best examples that I've seen are when companies value consumer input, first and foremost. And if they're sophisticated at getting it, um, that is fantastic. Um, the worst are, um, tend to be um, cult of personality, one person bands, um, where you know, we were talking before, they just are convinced that they've got the way. Um, so I think it's a, a continuum of how much you're willing to take in. Um, as far as bringing other people with you, I think if you warn people that this is going to change, that you know a lot of companies pivot, um, do not you know hang on too long to the wrong thing. You know if you can help people get ready for change and select people who are change comfortable, 
that also helps because there's definitely cultures where people are really locked in. Um, you know, in some industries are like that. Insurances, you're really locked in. You know, fashion, you're really not locked in. Um, what business are you in? Oh, okay, all right. Wow, I like it. It's a great benefit. It's a very good be It's a really good benefit. Um, and if you think, you know, the people you're serving might change or you think the way you might serve them might change, um, I think it's about laying that culture out and saying, we have this North Star. This is what we want to do. We want to empower people. But how we do it, we're going to learn and we're going to adjust. If you're good at that, then we want you. That, that's a big help. I guess I'm leaving you with this general message that while the framework appears simple, filling it out and living it is not simple. So give yourself a break. Um, you know. <laughs> yes? Uh, what does your general work flow um, in terms of finding out that knowledge that the person is missing? Um, what, do you start with just thinking about it and being sure to say this, or is this an illegal search and start to <laughs> dial it down? Well, I think that's kind of back to your question. Do you start with your, your idea or do you start with an unmet need and, and track it? Um, in the startup world, I think a lot of people come with the germ of an idea. And then um, what is often recommended is talk to the people that might be receptive to this idea, who might need it, and ask them about their problems. Let's say you're solving a problem. Learn about the problem and then adjust what you were thinking, and then repeat. <laughs> but you want to start out by not asking people about your specific idea, mm -hmm. but really finding out what their world is like, what they need. Yeah, like um, yeah. My, my thought process is that you would probably like do one on one, or do like a unit survey, or <coughs> what, what kind of information? Ah, OK, like how do you do it? Um, if it's possible for you to get one-on-one -on -one with people and have demonstrate something or just have them you know, talk to you about their problems, it's ideal. It will depend on what kind of problem it is. If it's like a, de a sensitive medical thing, you're going to want one-on-one -on -one with a lot of, of you know, trust established. If it's hemlines, get a bunch of skirt-wearing people in the room, it's not going to be a problem to hear about, you know, hemline opinions, <laughs> you know? So it depends a little bit on, on what it is that you're doing. Um, I prefer to start out qualitatively, which means asking open-ended questions and, and a small group of people and just getting to know them and that 40 people that Steve Blank loves so much. Um, but if you're trying to prove that there's a sizable market, then you want the quant. And in that case, you might be looking at what information that already exists that demonstrates how many people are suffering from blah, blah, blah. You know, and um, so it doesn't have to be research that you conduct. It could be research that you find. Can I ask one more sure, yeah. So, like, I think some of uh, my uh, product and offering uh, can be applied towards business or can be applied to customer. And then, like, different uh, target market can be identified. Yeah. Um, how would you um, narrow it down so that matches that niche just uh, mm. across and like, like general public yeah. or in corporate? Well, let me give you a framework for target selection. Um, can you read my writing? So this is they have a big, uh, what I mean, big number of people with an unmet need or desire. It's important to them to solve. You solve it better than anyone else at an attractive financial return. So on a startup case, it might just mean cash flow coming in, you know. So, you know, you've got all kinds of possibilities with your, your product because you, you could do hotels, you could do, you know, Medical whatever. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for those people who are live streaming that you will not be able to read my, my writing, but a uh, large number of people affected who have an unmet need. Um, 
they're determined to solve it or they desire it, um, you can do it better than anyone else at a decent, decent return financially. Um, so, you know, you could go to hotels um, or you could go to probably, what, another, another segment. Uh, um, filmmakers. filmmakers. Okay. Those are two different ones. So the first thing is to identify what of those segments is most attractive for you to go after first, second, and third. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so think about which of those checks all those boxes, and and you know rank them, because uh, you can't talk to hotel people the way you would talk, you know, to some other group. You can't. <coughs> that's that's called picking your target audience. <laughs> I know. Well, you might have to j make a decision there. Um, you know, and so, you know, one of the things I'd be doing is I would be talking with the film community and talking with the hotel community. It seems it looks like they're really slobbering over this idea and can act on it right away because you're a startup. You need that, you know, set of customers. You know, if they're not signing on the bottom line in Hollywood, they don't really want it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the KB player one coming up, so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's where all those little one-on-one -on -one conversations are really helpful. If you go into Warner Brothers Studios and they went, <laughs> you know, or if they said, oh, my God, don't talk to Paramount, <coughs> totally different answer. Um, <laughs> We've got a few more minutes. Um, happy to answer any other questions. Um, if anyone has a, a late-breaking thought, I, I'll stick around for a little while and, and – you know, you can gather your thoughts and ask me a question privately if you like. Um, but thank you all, and good luck. <laughs>